so good to see you. Welcome everybody as we come to bring our praise, our worship, our lives to God. Uh, we are an Easter people and we celebrate Jesus risen from the dead. So let's stand together. Let's sing out our praise as God's Easter people together. Here by heavy stone, 
lost in wonder, I'm lost in love, I'm lost in praise forevermore, because of Jesus, I'm failing in love, I am forgiven, I am restored. We're going to use these words of prayer. Thanks, John, if you could put that up. Thank you. Let's pray these words and say these words together. Risen Christ, you filled your disciples with boldness and fresh hope. Strengthen us to proclaim your risen life and fill us with your peace. To the glory of God the Father. Amen. And as you sit down, maybe you'd like to say hello to somebody, welcome somebody, greet somebody nearby to you. Okay, so welcome everybody. Welcome, welcome. And it's really good to see you here on site. Welcome if you're joining us online as well. And that's our theme this morning, because we're working through uh, this book this year called Love Your Church. And chapter two is about being a welcoming church. And we're going to be thinking about that uh, uh, this morning in different ways. And... Um, Here's my door. This door came from uh, Preston in our first church, and it's travelled with me. It's a very good visual aid. And it's back out. So um, the door is here. And what we're going to do over here, gang, you're going to help us think about the door. Uh, where's my uh, person who's going to hold the door? Hey, he's trained to do this. So he's got the muscles to do this. Uh, you look after the door. And... Uh, that's all you've got to do. So what we're going to do down here, some of you lot, if you can come and help. Where is he? Jordan and Katie are going to come and help. I'm going to arm you. We're just going to make the door red. Rather than paint it, we're going to use uh, our paper there. We're going to use sellotape there. We're going to use blue tack. It's all on here if you need more sellotape. And there you go. I'm going to let you do that as we think about this uh, Love Your Church uh, the issue of welcoming. And yes, it, it, hey, it was Easter eggs last week. It's love hearts this week. Just when you thought we got through them all. Yeah, Bob, take them to the back and distribute them for me. That would be really helpful. Thank you, Luke. Just when you thought we got rid of them all, they lurk and another tub comes out as we follow through this theme. Love your church. It's a great book, this. It's a great theme that we're into. And uh, Tony in chapter 2 talks about, uh, takes us to James chapter 2 uh, and, uh, and warns us about the sin of favouritism. When we, we, we kind of, we look at somebody and we, um, we, we make decisions about that person and we act differently maybe to some people than towards other people. And uh, my dear brothers and sisters... How can you claim to have faith in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ if you favour some people over others? It's a challenging statement that James brings to us. And, and when James talks about um, uh, favouritism, he uses an interesting phrase. And again, if you've read chapter 2 of the book, uh, Tony draws this out. Um, it means receiving the face or, or taking 
someone at face value. You, you kind of look at somebody, you, you make decisions, and then you act. And um, I wonder if you've ever done that. You do that maybe at work or at school or at home or in your road or even in church. As you take someone at kind of vase value, you, you uh, receive the face and you act. Well, in the church, faith and acts of favoritism don't go together. Not least for the Bible, uh, in, the Bible God sh- uh, in the Bible, God shows no favoritism, no partiality. And so it's contrary to, to show favoritism is contrary to the very character and behaviour of God. Let me read a couple of things from this book. How are we doing over there? We've got that door done yet? Nearly. Yeah. Nearly. Okay, that's good. That's good timing. Let me read this bit first. Because we're called to something much better. We're, we're called to grace-centred hospitality. Not showing favouritism, but to grace-centred hospitality and welcome. And uh, let me read this because uh, we're called to be uh, into into gracism. Gracism means extending favour to others irrespective of colour, class or culture. Gracism means that we deliberately desire to have a multi-ethnic and interracial fellowship. Gracism means that we... Sinners have been reconciled to God. We can now be agents of reconciliation with each other. Gracism means that grace is both preached and practiced towards others. Says Tony, we live as gracists because of Jesus' grace towards us. And then he has this, uh, uh, the red door bit. How are you doing? We've done it nearly. Great. Door. I wonder which door you would choose out of all those doors. If you had to choose the front door, have a look at that. Let me show you the the colour we're concerned about this morning. It's this. For this reason, he talks about Ray Ortland and his church and and how he gave, gave a welcome on one Sunday morning. Welcome to church. Now, there's one thing I invite you to understand. You may have noticed that when you walked in, that the doors out there are painted red. We can't do that in our building because they're glass. But And he had a wooden door, obviously. It's painted red. So you get the picture. Red door. That is an old Christian tradition. Because we enter into the church through the blood of Christ. Great picture, isn't it? We enter into the church... Through the blood of Christ. Out in the world where you live the rest of the week, we never measure up. Our lives are never complete. We never fully belong. Then we come into the church through the finished work of Christ on the cross. And what makes the difference here? The reason why we belong is that we're walking into completeness already prepared. Therefore, we can be weak, we can be honest with ourselves, with one another, and with the Lord. And he says, we belong, welcome. So to all who are weary and need rest, to all who mourn and long for comfort, to all who fail and desire strength, to all who sin and need a saviour, this church opens wide her red doors in the name of of Jesus, the friend of sinners. Welcome. I'm glad you're here. And then a, a comment on that, uh, that picture, that illustration uh, that comes. What a wonderful way to apply Paul's command to us to welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God. That's probably a little bit more than just saying hello to welcome. But it's great that we've done that and we started that this morning. Just imagine if that spirit were multiplied as it were lived out by millions of Christians around the world. Such grace and hospitality reflect the ministry of Jesus. And so... 
it's a red door. And uh, slide the door along here so we can see it in the middle here, our red door. Well done. And then on the screen you see there's a red door. And if you look closely at that red door, there's a cross on that red door. Just to remind us that we come into the church. Hey, you're going to leave me here to hold the door. <laughs> come and hold the door for me. <laughs> we, we enter in. We're welcomed because of the blood of Jesus and that finished work of salvation. And so we belong and we, we become a, a community of grace-centered hospitality and welcome. Well, that, that's what we are, but we want to be better than that. We want the Lord to help us, strengthen us in that, and take us uh, on into that more and more in the days to come. So, when you see a red door now, you um, can remember that, 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 that tradition of, of red doors and how we enter in through the blood of Jesus. If you're thinking about painting your door this Easter holiday, red would be a good colour. Uh, even if you support Manchester City, it would be a good colour. There you go. Thank you. You're brilliant at that. If you stand there now for the next hour, that would be really, really good. Now, we're going to slide it that way. Can you take it down there for me? And we'll lie it down so our friends down there don't, don't knock it and it land on them. That would be really good if you can put it down there for me out of the way. Great. Okay, so that's it. Thank you, Toby. Brilliant stuff. Um, we're doing some stuff here as well. Let me uh, highlight. We're highlighting together. By the way, not only is it Love Hearts, but we've been uh, doing, um, uh, taking out Easter eggs to the, the shops, and we've got a few extras. And so no need to rush downstairs to refreshments first, because we've got quite a few of these. But uh, you better have an Easter egg. Uh, because every day is an Easter egg day. Because every day is Easter day. And, um, um, and we've got a few spare. So there you go. When we have refreshments later on, you can have your Easter egg. It blends nicely with the gummy heart, I find. So uh, there and you the go. And the dentist. And the dentist, yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I saw the dentist this week, yeah. That's all right. Okay, so we're, we're Zooming tonight, Joe. Yes, if you um, haven't ever come along to one of our communions on Zoom, it would be great to see you. It's just for 25, 30 minutes, and uh, you, have your, you stay in your house, and you have your own bread and wine, and we have some worship, prayer, and chat together. Um, the link was on the newsletter, but if you're not sure, uh, ask me, and I can get it to you. So Zoom in tonight, fizzing. No, I'm going to do this all the way through. I'm not, I've just looked. I'm not going to be able to do it all the way through, but we're going to do it for the next couple. Okay. Zooming, now fizzing. So you should know that we're relaunching Fizz, and Jordan is going to be heading this up for us, and it starts um, not this Wednesday, but the following Wednesday at 4 o'clock. And it'd be great if some children came along. So come along, children, and bring your friends from school as well, from reception to year five. If you could help Jordan and be part of the team... Uh, weekly, fortnightly, once a month, doing stuff behind the scenes. Could you have a word with him and offer to help? Because we need a really good team to get this started. And there's a, the little leaflets that you could take. So if you've got people you know that would like to come along to our, our midweek group, that would be great. So Zooming, fizzing and gathering. Yeah, so I've been explaining this to lots of people <laughs> this morning, so you might have already heard it. But on the Saturday afternoon at 3 o'clock is a seniors event. And if you'd like to sign up for that, then speak to Judy or one of the team. sorting that out, yeah. In the evening, um, Di and Kath are going to be with the young adults. So that's sort of 17 plus. Yes. So if you'd like to come along to that, have a word with Luke and Katie. Yes. And uh, be part of that. And on the Sunday, it's not a 10.30 service. There's a 9.15 and 11.15. They will both be exactly the same. They will both have children's work, the youth will stay in in both, and the food will be the same, and diet will be the same. So it's just whichever one you prefer. If you don't want breakfast, that's okay, just come along and have a cup of tea. Um, you can uh, just sit there, you can chat to people. Just, it's going to be a service as well, it's not so, just breakfast. But the idea is to have it as a, a cafe style, and we're thinking that some of the people we've invited to Dai Warridge events <coughs> recently might like to come to that. So it's going to be 
Yeah. Although it's a, it, it, we're going to gather and we're going to pray and we're going to have some music and worship and we'll look at the Bible together. But it'd be in that it'd sort of style. It'd be great for guests, for yeah. friends and neighbours. And yeah. uh, although you may not like brunch or might have had your breakfast earlier, if you were to go to all these cafes around in Clevedon Precisely. today, there'd be so many people having breakfast, brunch, having tea cakes and pastries and things. So Ooh. it should be... Sounds great. <laughs> yeah, don't all go and do that now. But on that Sunday, you'll be able to come along, bring your friends, your neighbours, husbands, wives, who don't normally come to church, and we're going to have good mornings together. That's why the, um, there's two, because we're hoping for lots of guests that day. We are. So we need to fit everybody so in. So we're trying to work how we're going to do that. That's going to be great. So you, so you can sign up this morning yeah. on the clipboard. You can do it via church suite. You can email the office. If you come um, at 10.30, it would be fine, because you come to 11.15, yeah. that would be fine. But, uh, yes, okay. And then we're Alpha Marriage Coursing. In May, um, if you would like to come on the Alpha Marriage Course or, again, have friends and neighbours who you'd like to invite, uh, it'd be good to know in advance for catering. We've Seven got, sessions, going to be really good. Really good. We've got, already got some people signed up, which is really encouraging. So we're going to go for this. It's going to be a really, really excellent thing to do. And, um, yes, really good thing to do. <laughs> And Kinsuki Hope is starting in April at half past two on the 25th. And uh, if you'd like to come to that, speak to Ruth Berry or to Jenny Schaefer. Yep. And uh, again, that's for you to come along, but you also might know friends you could invite along and say, do you want to come to this safe place and uh, uh, be par part of that? Okay, and then there's just two more things to mention. Uh, uh, kind of a month's time, isn't it? Uh, when we do the next Love Your Church, actually. but uh, Yeah, that's going to be a sunny, hot day by then. Is it? Great. <laughs> and we're going to have church in the morning, an all-age service, and then, um, just moving my coffee out of Thea's way, just in case. Um, and then we're going to go to Ken Village Hall and have a picnic together. Bring your own picnic. Drinks and cake will be supplied, and there'll be games... Or if you just want to sit in a chair and chat, you can do that. But there'll be activities there'll and be games some activities as well. well. It's just to get together and use that uh, lovely place and uh, have some time together, gathered in worship and gathered with some food together. And uh, some people have been to Spring Harvest already. I know Luke and Katie have been there. Luke's been leading worship at Spring Harvest at Skegness. But it's the Minehead Gang yeah, going there's from There's quite the a few people going from the church to Spring Harvest yeah. tomorrow. So if you could remember to pray for them and pray that they'd uh, be really yeah. touched by God. That's right. and some people, I think, are stewarding there from the church as well. I know Susan definitely is, and that's good. So and Spring maybe Harvest. next year people would like to go. Um, it'd be great. Yeah great to have a yeah. bigger group go from yes. the church as well so that's good so down in mine head for the week so pray for uh, our church group at spring harvest and to remind you that we bring our offerings to the lord as we bring our lives to god in worship and so lord we bring our offerings to you and lord we thank you that we are welcomed into your kingdom through Jesus and his death on the cross for us and we're welcomed into the community of the kingdom uh, your church and we thank you for one another and we pray for one another and we pray Lord that you would do great and marvellous things around us and through us and we offer ourselves we bring our offerings we bring our money to you and pray Lord that this will be used for your kingdom in Jesus name Amen ok so as the children move out thank you for doing the door Gang over there, brilliant work. We're going to move out. Youth are going to move out to their group. Children move out to their group. We're going to stand together, sing of God's wonderful mercy, his mercies that are new every morning, and we will worship him. In brokenness and wandering, through all my fear and unbelief, your faithfulness appears to me again Through mountain top and valley low In every season this I know Your goodness like the dawn will break again For your mercy's rising in this heart again my soul begins to sing. They are new every morning, new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Your mercies are new every morning, new every morning. Oh, great is your faithfulness. Every good and perfect gift. 
she give flowing from the Father's heart to mine? Oh, beams of heaven as I go through this wilderness below the fullness of your love for all of time. Oh, your mercy's rising in this heart again, and my soul begins to sing. They are new every morning, new every morning. Oh, great is your faith. Please sit down. We're going to think about this welcome theme together. And uh, it's really important, uh, I sense, that we sort of, when we think about this, this is more than just the people that are on the welcome team. They're important people. Of course they are. And, and it's, it, it's more than, 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 than saying hello to people. Well, that's really important. To come into a community and no one speaks to you is, is just, that is not a good thing. And so having the courage to say hello and, and, and how are you and to get to know people is really important. It's more than the signage, so people know where they're going. Although that, those sort of things are really important. Uh, we went somewhere, not a church thing, we went somewhere recently and I, we couldn't find our way into the building because the signage was hopeless. Uh, and they, didn't, they weren't good at welcome, actually. Uh, and we, we want to be good at doing that. And so we're, we... Um, we, we know our way around this place, but people new to us don't always know that. And so welcoming, helping people and so on. But it's, it's an us thing. Uh, and we need, in, in the, the right sense, there's a, a weight of responsibility that falls upon us all here. And I want us, uh, in a good way, to feel that. Uh, and uh, Abby's going to help us as we come to God's Word in a few minutes' time, just to get our heads and hearts around this, this whole idea of being a, a welcoming, grace-centred community of hospitality. So the so kind of couple of questions up there, just so we start to, to, to get in, into this and we have a little bit of a conversation together about uh, how are we going to do this uh, and, uh, and, uh, uh, and, and, the, and the question is sort of loaded <coughs> towards us, towards you, so, so together. So when we look at this whole thing, it's not just about what others are going to do or what the church is going to do, it's what we are going to be doing as we work this stuff through. Just as Christ welcomes us, how are we going to welcome others? Well, there's, there's some, some question. Now, where, where's, that, where's the hearts gone? Where's the tub of hearts? We can have another dose of these. Yeah, get, uh, I need to get rid of... No, I'd like you to have one if you'd like one. Uh, so you can chew on one of these. Thank you. We've got, that's great what you're doing there. Chew on one of these, but more importantly, little link here, chew on these questions uh, and have a, a conversation. Then we'll worship together and then we'll, we'll come and uh, unpack God's word together as well. So let, let's do that for a few minutes. Uh, and it's a great way of introducing yourself to somebody if you're not sure who they are. And yet, find out their name. And that would be um, really, really helpful. So let's, let's do that for a few minutes. Welcoming one another.
Okay. We're going to pray together. Christ our Redeemer, thank you for preparing a place for us in the Father's house to dwell with you for all eternity. We pray that many more people will hear and believe the message of salvation, that through your death and resurrection they can be forgiven, reconciled with God and be welcomed into the kingdom of heaven. My brothers and sisters, believers in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ must not show favouritism. But if you show favouritism, you, you sin and you are conv convicted by the law as lawbreakers. Lord, we repent of the sin of favouritism, treating people based on appearances. Thank you that your word corrects and sets us on the right path. Lord, you're calling us into grace-centred hospitality. Therefore, Father, please bless everyone who welcomes a person into their lives by offering accommodation or a meal, inviting them to share their needs or including them in a church family or other community group. Please grant them compassion and grace from your loving heart. Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together. The grace of God has reached for me and pulled me from the raging sea. And I am saved on the solid ground. The Lord is my salvation. I will not fear when darkness falls. Your strength will help me scale these walls. I'll see the dawn of the rising sun. The Lord is my salvation. each promise of his word when winter fades and a spring will come the Lord is my salvation in times of waiting in times of need when I know lost when I grace will renew these earth cause the Lord is my salvation
me all right today? Lovely. So, welcoming. 
and grace-centered hospitality. Okay, I'll click it again. There we go. So, the passage today um, that we're going to be looking at is Acts 2, 42 to 47. Uh, if you have your church Bibles in front of you, that's page 832. And whilst you're just thumbing through or finding the correct bit on your app, Um, I thought I'd just give you a little bit of an overview of what we're going to do in the next 20 minutes. And what we want to talk really about here is hospitality. So Anthony's already spoken quite a bit about welcome, but we want to talk here about hospitality. So we're going to have a little bit of a think about what our culture's idea of hospitality is, what the Bible's idea of hospitality is. We're going to have a little bit of a chance to chat to one another about our experience of hospitality, both good and bad. And then we're going to think about what the heart of hospitality should be and the need for hospitality. What's the point of it? And then we're just going to finish off with a few tips and hints at the end, which I hope might be helpful. So Acts 2, 42. The believers form a community. All the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship and sharing in meals, including the Lord's Supper, and to prayer. A deep sense of awe came over all of them, and the apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders. And all the believers met together in one place and shared everything that they had. They sold their property and possessions and shared the money with those in need. They worshipped together at the temple each day, met in homes for the Lord's Supper, and shared meals with great joy and generosity, all the while praising God and enjoying the goodwill of all the people. And each day the Lord added to their fellowship those who were being saved. Now we're obviously looking, as Anthony's mentioned today, about the second chapter in the Welcoming um, and Love Your Church book. And what it talks about here, obviously, is welcoming and hospitality. And what we want to do is have a little bit of a think, really, about what should hospitality be looking like for us as Christians in the 21st century? How should we do it? We hear a lot in our culture about hospitality in terms of things like corporate hospitality, hospitality industry, Uh, perhaps you even have a title in your job that contains the word hospitality, perhaps something like hospitality manager. In fact, most of us at some point will have been employed in the hospitality industry. Industry. Perhaps you have worked in a pub or a restaurant. Perhaps you have worked in a hotel or some sort of accommodation. Um, Or perhaps you've been at some sort of recreation or entertainment centre. But the hospitality industry in the UK is massive, absolutely massive. Uh, 71.3 billion for those that like figures in 2023, although that was down from the pre-pandemic heights of 103.8 billion, and that's in the UK alone. So it's probably no surprise that there's an awful lot of use of the word hospitality in our culture. But it's got me asking the question, what is real hospitality? The word hospitality itself, if you look it up in the uh, dictionary, means to provide a friendly and generous reception and entertainment of guests, visitors and strangers. But is this what we mean when we talk about things like the hospitality industry? What does our culture really think about things like the hospitality industry? Well, I would suggest within our culture that the very term of hospitality has been somewhat eroded and now seems to mean welcoming and entertaining of certain guests, perhaps those that are wealthy or a certain demographic, uh, in order to make money or to gain influence or to gain power. Rather than being about friendship and generosity, as we've heard in the dictionary definition, we instead treat hospitality as a way of influencing people to get something in return. But this is obviously not God's view of hospitality. And as we've just heard from the book of Acts there, we've seen some of the ways that the early church demonstrated their hospitality. But the Bible is full of many more examples. Uh, Leviticus 19.34, it states, The foreigner residing among you must be treated as your native-born. Love them as yourself. 
So this passage is encouraging us to love those that we extend hospitality to, not just to give them hospitality. Jesus, when teaching about humility, says in Luke 14, 12, when you give luncheon or dinner, do not invite your friends, your brothers, your sisters, your relatives, the rich, your neighbours. If you do, they might invite you back and you will be repaid. But when you give a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame and the blind, and you will be blessed. Although they cannot repay you, you will be repaid at resurrection of the righteous. And this passage obviously reminds us to extend hospitality beyond those that we might, might be able to give a status or influence, and particularly to those who may not be able to repay us in any way. In Matthew 25, 42 to 46, Jesus reminds us of the importance to invite strangers, to feed and clothe those in need, and to visit those who are sick or imprisoned. For when we do so, we are doing so as if it were him. And again, this reminds us that we should treat others as if they were God himself. And finally, Romans 12, 13 says, share, the Lord's, um, share with the Lord's people who are in need and practice hospitality. And the list goes on. Many more passages in the Bible. As we can see, the Bible's description of hospitality is differing somewhat in motive and reach to the world's idea of hospitality. Um, it's clear from these passages that all should be welcomed, all should be loved, whether rich, poor, slave, free, Jew, Gentile, male or female, friend or enemy. We should show hospitality because of what Christ gives to us and not because we should be expectant of something in return. In Acts, we see the early church working out hospitality in different ways. They're sharing meals together, they're sharing bread and wine together, they're worshipping together, they're meeting together, they're sharing their possessions together. They're giving to the poor. But even more importantly, in verse 46, it says that they did it with joy and generosity. And I think there's a real challenge to us in the church today to try and reclaim the true meaning of hospitality and demonstrate it in our lives. So as we explore this topic a little further, I thought it'd be good to give you a chance to chat to one another again, because we all like doing that. And it's always good for hospitality too. But I thought it'd be good to have a little chat about some of our own experiences of hospitality. So I've got three questions for you. Um, you can either think about themselves or you can chat to someone near you. And I want you to have a little think about when have you experienced good hospitality and what was it that made it good? When have you experienced bad hospitality and what was it that made it bad? And also, what stops us from enjoying or doing more hospitality? Um, so if you want to have a chat together, and then I'm going to ask a few people, if you're brave enough, just give us a little snippet at the end. So you don't all have to do that, but I'm just, I'll tell you up front that that's what I'm planning. Okay? So have a chat amongst yourselves.
That's great. Now, is anyone brave enough to share us a little, share with us a little snippet of your conversation? What have we experienced? Let's start first. What have we experienced that was good in terms of hospitality? What was it that made us good? You can put your hands up. Hands on the way. It's green mic. <coughs> Hungry, when you go to someone's house, they give you their own slippers for you to wear. Ooh. In some cultures, that's much more of a thing as well, particularly Korean cultures. When the church visited Bulgaria, we went to Lom, and um, there was a lady called Borka who uh, was very poor and very um, hospitable. She gave us food and all sorts. I'm, I'm sure, you know, she couldn't possibly afford what she gave us, but um, she wouldn't hear of anything else, you know, and that, and that was really good hospitality. It's a real generosity, even when she couldn't afford it. Make an arm run this one. Good for my fitness level. <coughs> Actually, I'm speaking on Wednesday's behalf, really. I was on, on a lovely holiday with uh, an, an unknown company. Uh, I went to a very poor uh, hotel on an industrial estate. Uh, and one of the other guests there actually offered to take her into her own home and provide refreshments. Yeah. Fantastic. An absolute stranger. Wonderful. Yeah. yeah. So helping someone out. Um, when I moved several years ago up to Durham, um, I was up there house hunting and I went into a local church in their coffee shop and a very kind lady came over and chatted to me and when she found out I was moving up there, knew absolutely nobody, she gave me her number and she said, oh, on the day you're moving, let me know and she brought over a pint of milk and she was just absolutely lovely and um, when you're up there with complete strangers, it was a really appreciated, friendly face. Yeah. It's a real welcome of a stranger. That's great. Can anyone give some bad examples? Now, just remember we're recording, so no names <laughs> here, people. Don't want to cause discourse, but um, anybody give an example of something where they've experienced bad hospitality, or maybe what it was about the hospitality that made it not so good? I'll try and keep this brief, because um, I, I don't like to be on the negative side when we're talking about things like this, but... Um, I was just sharing with some people about an um, experience with someone that I knew, I worked alongside. Um, he wanted to go to church, he was really keen on it and um, he had two children, so it was a good thing uh, in total to do. So anyway, um, I, I, can't, I wouldn't mention the church anyway, but he started going and he used to be very casual in clothes, clothes that he wore. Jeans was in a t-shirt was really what he was comfortable with. But as for going to church, he would occasionally put a, a pair of casual um, slacks on. So he'd kind of, it would be almost in, alternate, you know, one, one, one week jeans, one week slacks. And he noticed almost instantly that when he walked in with jeans, people didn't really... They weren't so warm as when he walked, with, walked in the slacks. And he noticed it straight away, and it, mm. it turned him away from going to church. It's just, just a bit sad. Yeah, yeah. I, I always remember my dad telling me a story of when he used to go into a state agent years ago, and we were looking to move house, and he went in one day in his casual jeans and, and T-shirt, hardly got any response from the estate agent team. He went in the next day in his suit, and they were all there asking, and you're just like, yeah treating people differently depending on what they look like. Any other negative experiences? One more over here. Oh, right on. <laughs> so this was, this was a little while ago when I, so I was divorced at 27 from my first husband, not Tom obviously. Um, so I was much younger and thinner and prettier at that point. And that, this is important to the story. Um, and I was going to a church. My sister and her fiancé, kind of, well, she lived with me and he kind of was there a lot of the time. Um, they would be invited to things as the church and I would actively not be invited because I was single and also because I was a young woman who might hit on their husbands. 
And so I was actively not invited to things, even though my sister and her partner were. And that was really harsh, because I'd just got divorced. So that was um, really, really hurtful. Yeah. Which and was I, not, not enjoyable. No, and I think that it's difficult. And it is, it is harder for when, when you are single and, and that, you know, we, there's lots of people I've spoken to that have been in that boat. I've been in that boat when I was younger, um, where, you know, married couples are getting invited to things and, and singletons aren't. So we need to be really mindful that we're not um, changing our um, hospitality list based on someone's home circumstance. Cool. That's brilliant. Thanks, Sam, for that. So I think, in summary, I think, you know, good experiences normally boil down to feeling like someone really cared for you, like they were generous, like they were going out of their way, and that there was integrity, they were being real, uh, they weren't putting on an act. I think we can all see that, can't we, sometimes in the hospitality in industry where people say lovely things to us, but actually there's an element that feels like it's not really real, they're just saying something to make us feel better, and, rather than it necessarily being the truth. And again, what's bad, the root of bad hospitality is often that we didn't feel welcomed or wanted or that we felt someone wanted something from us in return. So it didn't feel genuine. So key to good hospitality is not actually how good we are at cooking. It's not actually how good we are at making small talk, although both of those things can obviously have their place and be quite helpful. Um, nor is it the size of our budget but it's about love and compassion. And I came across a lovely um, quote from a lady called Henrietta Mears, who was a Christian educator and evangelist. And she said the following, hospitality should have no other nature than love. If we love someone, we want them to feel welcomed. We enjoy spending time with them. We enjoy cooking for them. What was a, suddenly a burden can be, will not feel a burden if it's someone that we love and care for. And therefore, it's important that we reach out to people in love. Hospitality is meant to bring us joy. It's not actually meant to be a trial. It's not another thing that we're meant to add to our to-do list um, in order to fulfill a quota or a requirement. But it's not easy, is it, to love someone when we don't yet know them, when they're a stranger, uh, harder still can, it can be to love someone if we disagree with them, they're a little bit difficult, uh, or they may actually be, frankly, our enemy. And yet that is exactly what Jesus asks us to do. So how do we do it? How do we develop love for those around us who are not part of our normal group, who are not part of our immediate family or friendship group? And the answer to that is that we need to see them as God sees them. Hebrews 13, 12 says, Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for by doing that, some have entertained angels without even knowing it. Isn't that a lovely idea? The idea that people are actually angels. C.S. Lewis, in his book, The Weight of Glory, says something, diff um, something similar. I always love C.S. Lewis. And he says this, There are no ordinary people you have never talked to a mere mortal. It is immortals that we joke with, work with, marry, snub, and exploit. They may be our immortal horrors or our everlasting splendors. We need to remember that those people, no matter how difficult or challenging, are God's children. They are made by his perfect hands, even if the exterior may be less than appealing. Inside each of us is a child looking for their father. To find the heart of hospitality, we need to see the creation that God has made inside that person rather than their outward experience. We need to remember that inside each person is some treasure just waiting to be found. So we need to ask God to give us more love for us, for others and also to step out of our comfort zone and to trust that God will bless us and help us to see the joy in being hospitable. It's only in getting out of our comfort zone and taking a risk that we are going to start to see the true gems that lie beneath the exterior of some of those people and difficult characters that we meet on a day-to-day -day basis. We talked before about what stops us from being hospi hospitable. I won't go around again, because we've done quite a lot of chatting today. But I'm guessing that for quite a few people, it was things like maybe time. Do I have time to be hospitable? Fear that 
worried that you might get stuck with someone who's a bit difficult or that in some way you might be taken advantage of. Perhaps it's money. Oh, I don't really have the money to entertain someone. Or perhaps it's just life is busy, I've got lots of work to do, how do I fit this in with everything else? There's lots of things that can get in the way. But the need for hospitality is that people are lonely. And the need for hospitality is that actually we were made, in fact our whole essence of being, our purpose for being here, was to be in relationship with God and relationship with one another. And yet we are so busy doing our work, perhaps trying to work hard to gain possessions or seeking individual forms of entertainment, that we are spending less and less time doing the thing that we were created for. The thing that should bring us joy, both to ourselves and to others, and that is by being with other people. And so it's no wonder that loneliness and anxiety is at an all-time high. Um, I currently have the privilege of running our Alpha course. Um, here at CBC, which for anyone that doesn't know, Alpha is just a course that helps people to ask questions about the Christian faith who are maybe exploring and want to know a bit more about what we believe and why we believe it. And as part of that course, each week we get to watch a video which is on a particular topic around the Christian faith. And one of the things that they do each week is they go out and ask strangers on these videos questions and just see what answers come up. And it's not filtered. They literally just go for the raw answers of what people, and they've done it all around the world, all around the globe, asking people questions. And on one of the recent videos, they asked people whether they feel lonely. And you know, all bar one said yes. In fact, the one that didn't say yes, the one that said that they weren't lonely, was actually clearly a committed Christian because they said so afterwards. Um, but for everyone else, even those that clearly had some faith, they said that they were either lonely some of the time, that perhaps they were lonely most when they were in a big crowd, or they were lonely, but they were, did a better job at distracting themselves than maybe some others do. And we are in the midst of a loneliness epidemic. I also had the opportunity a few weeks ago, we had our last warm bank, and it's lovely to be able to help out with a few of those. And some of the cards that Anne and the team received were absolutely wonderful. But do you know what was most interesting about what was in those cards was the thing that every single one of them said, which was that the thing they would miss most was being welcome and being able to chat. More than even the soups, which they all loved, the cakes, which they all loved, wherever Ray is. Um, but what they needed and what they really wanted, what they valued, was people spending time with them and being there for them. And unfortunately, our society teaches us the reverse, doesn't it? It teaches us that possession and power are what we should aspire to, that we should treat our own homes like our fortress, a place where no one but our immediate family should be, a place of safety. But as Christians, we're called to live quite a different way. In fact, our refuge or our fortress should be God and not our home. The cultural drive to get more, to keep it to ourselves, and to try and keep ourselves to ourselves is stripping us of all that brings us joy in terms of spending time with others and spending time with God. Now, for all the introverts in the room, I am an introvert, um, you might be thinking, oh, spending time with people, that is not me. I prefer to be on my own. I like having time to myself, get a bit overwhelmed when I'm with others. And I do hear you. I, I have to take breaks from time to time. I love being with people, but I also need to have a bit of time to myself. But, in fact, even if our natural inclination is to be more of an introvert, we all need to spend time with people. No matter how much of an introvert, we are blessed by spending time with others. And no one gets blessed by spending all their time alone. Um, as part of this preparation for this talk, I've been reading a few different books on Christian hospitality. Some I had, some have been given to me by Anthony. Um, and there was one that I read which, said, which was called The Day is Yours, and it's by a Baptist minister called Ian Stackhouse. Um, and this book helps us to sort of regain a better rhythm to our life. That's its, its aspiration. So in this fast-paced world that we're in, how do we get back to living a more God-inspired rhythm? And one of the chapters was all about the culture of the table. And it highlights the importance of spending regular time with people at the meal table. And in this chapter, he quotes a philosopher called Albert Borgman, who said the following. 
It would perhaps be too strong to suggest that recovery of the mealtime is the linchpin upon which Western civilization depends. <coughs> Even to put it like that sounds laughable. As if cultural renewal depends on eating together. And yet, if we are to enter into the rhythm of a daily spirituality, learning to live eucharistically, so to speak, content with what we have and mindful of the poor, then it seems to me that the meal table is about as good a place to start as any. And it made me think again, that passage, particularly about the importance of eating with others and also the importance of eating with others within our own household too. But it's a challenge, isn't it? We're in a busy society. In fact, at home, we fought quite hard to maintain regular meal times together and I think now the kids are older, it's often only once a day that we actually manage that. But I'm reminded again of all the different conversations we've had over the years around the meal table. Some serious, some extremely random, some bizarre. There's a particular one recently around how certain letters make you think of certain colours, apparently. Doesn't happen to me, but for two of my children it's a big thing, and then we had a whole comparison as to which letter makes you think about which colour. Um, but there's certainly no doubt that those conversations over the years have brought us closer together. And so it reminds me again of the challenge about how we can get more people around our table and how we can make sure that we're spending time together as a family too. So it's certainly a challenge and perhaps it's one for you too. Our culture's reality is we spend less and less time together and it's not good for our well-being, but it's also not good for our ability to share our faith with other, others. Uh, Eugene Peterson writes that a culture of inhospitality, inhospi oh, I'm going to have problems getting this one out, am I? A culture of inhospitality forebodes resurrection famine. He likes big words, does Eugene Peterson. So I'm going to read that one again. A culture of inhospitality forebodes resurrection famine. To put it another way, or in plainer English, um, what he's saying to us there is that reaching others with the gospel is important, sorry, reach, <laughs> doing hospitality is important for reaching people with the gospel. Without it, Peterson suggests that we will struggle to bring people to God if we don't do more hospitality. So if hospitality is good for our health and the health of others and evangelism, then how do we go about doing more? How do we go about building hospitality in our lives without getting overwhelmed? And how do we make it a joy and not a burden? So I've pulled together a few hints and tips. These are not all mine. Some of them have come from some of the books I've been reading. But hopefully they might be of help. The first thing, don't rule yourself out. Everyone has a role to play in hospitality. It's not just for those who can cook, for women, for those who are married, or for those who are wealthy. All can contribute and extend hospitality to others. Spending time with others is good for us too. It's not just a one-way street. So we don't need to think about hospitality as just another thing we need to do for others. There is actually a lot of benefit we can gain from it for ourselves and our own well-being. Don't put unnecessary ex expectations onto yourself. I don't know which, uh, whether you look like more the uh, table there that are looking at their phones or the table there that are chatting more. But don't put unnecessary expectations onto yourself. Hospitality is not about cordon bleu cooking. It is not about beautifully clean houses. It's not make, about making our family look perfect. Um, nor is it about reciprocation, as we've already heard. It's also not about making the best conversation, or even knowing the best coffee shop to invite someone to, or even being the best at entertaining. But in fact, I could go one step further and say that actually as Christians, we need to avoid trying to make things look perfect when we do hospitality, because that is not the point. The point of hospitality is to care for someone else, to love someone else, and to show them God. If you can't cook, that's fine. Get pizza. Go for takeout. If you can't afford food for others, just offer to go for a walk with someone or host to bring and share. If you are single and do not want to do hospitality on your own, find someone else to do it with. Perhaps another singleton, perhaps a couple that you can help, but don't feel that you have to do it on your own. Overdoing it or trying to create a, face, 
create a fake illusion of your home is not what's called for. If you're worried about having people in your home, then meet up with other people outside your home. Or invite people you are comfortable with into your home alongside a guest that you don't know so well. Give yourself confidence by having someone there that you feel comfortable with to ask other people in. Remember to ask God to, who to invite when you do hospitality. We are all prone to bias, some of it obvious, some of it less obvious. But have a think and pray when you're doing hospitality. Who is it that God needs you to reach out to at this time? If you are not good at small talk or the guest is quiet, then invite someone else on along that's good at chatting. Or maybe invite them to do something with you that doesn't involve quite so much talking. If you no longer have the energy or health to have people for meals or to go for walks, and perhaps with some of our um, congregation that are watching us from home today, you may be at the stage of your life where you are only seeing carers or close family. But don't let this deter you. When you see people, whether they come to care for you or just to drop in, welcome them with a smile, chat and learn about them, and let them know that you've remembered them next time you see them. Making people feel like they are important and are being seen is also good hospitality. Find a way to include hospitality in your normal day. It doesn't need to be a special thing. I remember 1970s, three-course meals. My parents, when they used to have people round, it was all like pristine cooking, very ornate. Doesn't need to be that. Invite people in to your normal meal, cook what you normally have, other than fish and chips, quite fine. We don't need to do fancy things. If you don't have time or skill to make a cake, buy a cake, drop it into someone that you've just met, a new neighbour. If you like doing a similar hobby, and particularly for the introverts here, we don't always like talking, but working alongside one another, doing something together, whether it's art, whether it's the gardening, whether it's knitting, uh, or whether it's something much more productive like going to the gym, um, then find yourself a gym buddy. But you can do that with other people. And remember, it's not a competition. Your gifts and skills and what you can manage, um, it's... Yeah, use your gifts and skills for what you can manage. And don't use comparison as a reason to stop you. Just because you can't do all those things that that friend of yours did or that neighbour did doesn't mean that you can't do hospitality. You can. And if you need extra motivation, just remember that the most successful evangelism nearly always comes from including others in our lives and not just from attendance at one-off church events, no matter how great those church events are. Just to finish, Henry J.M. Nguyen, the Dutch Catholic priest and theologian, said this. Hospitality means primarily the creation of free space, where the stranger can enter and become a friend instead of an enemy. Hospitality is not to change people, but to offer them a space where change can take place. It is not to bring men and women over to our side, but to offer freedom, not disturbed by dividing lives. Should we pray? Father God, we thank you so much for Jesus and for his, um, his and the um, early Christian church's example of hospitality. Father, we pray, would you help us to um, be, do more around hospitality? Father, would you help us not to have expectations that are set by this world, but to have expectations that are the ones sent by you. Father, help us to reach out to those around us and also not to fill a burden. Help us to feel love for those that we reach out to. Help us to see the gems that hide behind the exteriors of some of the more difficult characters that we bump into. And help us, Lord, not to just stay within our own bubbles, but to be brave and to actually go out and meet people and invite people into our homes. In Jesus' name. So we're going to uh, just give two things, practical things that we can follow this through with, and then we're going to sing our our final hymn together. John, is, you can you my PowerPoint pictures there? There's one that's got the action steps in this book. Love your church. Your your there's your you know if you've been reading it and you've been using it in home groups. There's the the, the action step page, and um, uh, and in it. 
there's three rules of engagement. They're gonna, hopefully we're going to find the, the slide in a minute come up on the, the screen. But here they are. An alone person in our gathering is an emergency. Number two, friends can wait. Three, introduce a newcomer to someone else. Then this is a bit. Let's all be missionaries at church today. Don't attend corporate worship as a consumer watching the show, but as a minister eager to welcome and to bless. Eager to welcome and bless others. That, that could be a new you. You may already be doing that. But just think, that, that could be a new CBC. If we took those three action steps and we see someone alone in our gathering, that's an emergency. Our friends, however important they are, they can wait. We're, we're going to welcome and introduce them into community here. So that, that's something, not just for this morning, but going forward. So that's about welcome. And then hospitality, we yeah. want to encourage our home groups, don't we? Yes, yeah, so we want to encourage our home groups. We've got a bit of a challenge for each of our home groups. And that really is for over the next few months, so I'm running up to the end of summer, if we can consider in each of our home groups turning over one session to something to do with hospitality. So when, that might be a meal, if you want to do a meal. That might be coffee morning. That might be afternoon tea. That might be doing a walk, but what we want to do is encourage the small groups or home groups to be places where we can also draw new people in to hospitality, to our relationship with us, um, and help direct them towards God. So it, that's really the challenge, is for each of the home groups sometime over this summer period to set aside one session. Maybe at normal time you do home group, you may decide to do an extra thing, that's up to you. Um, but we'd love to be inviting more people in. And particularly think about those that are already connected to you as a home group. So maybe we've got partners, husbands, wives that aren't in the church, family that aren't in the church. Have a think about who it is you want to reach, and that may also direct you as to what sort of event it is that you want to do. But it doesn't need to be fancy, okay? It doesn't need, we're not talking three-course meals here. Just have an event where you can have a few more people in. Um, I fortunately came from a, a church where we did this a lot within small groups. We often have meals. And actually, it's amazing how many people came into the church through the small groups, through the home groups. Okay, that so way. we've got welcoming. So just in case you don't realise, you're on the welcome team now. And there's the opportunity together in our home groups to, to venture into some more hospitality together. Exciting days. We'd love to hear back how things are going and... Uh, uh, let's see God at work in us and through us as we become even better at welcoming others and offering hospitality to others. And it's all because of God's grace, a grace-centered church. So we stand and sing about God's amazing grace, amazing grace. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. The saved a wretch like me I once was lost but now I find was blind but now I see twas grace at taught my heart to fear and grace my fear that grace appeared the hour I first believed my chains are gone I've been set free my God my Savior has ransomed me and like a flood His mercy
us that we need others as they need us, that you call us not to isolated commitment, but to a community of faith, working with others to make possible what we could not achieve alone. So Lord, thank you that you welcome us into your kingdom and you call us to be a grace-centered people of welcome and of hospitality. And so come, Spirit of God, and fill us anew as we go to serve and seek first your kingdom. In Jesus' name. Amen.